Bula everybody, so I'm sitting now with a very popular face in Fiji scene, a climate warrior and podcaster, Fenton Lutunatumbo. How are you? I'm doing well, thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy that you agreed to join <laughs> us today and out here in nature, which I felt was really appropriate. Very fitting. Considering the work that you do. Mm -hmm, very yes. fitting. <laughs> Appreciate so, it. A lot of people don't know very much about your childhood and about mm -hmm. the way that you grew up. So tell me about young Fenton. Was young Fenton a climate warrior? Ah, that's such a great question. Uh, I grew up in Pacific Harbor, so so by the water, and I find I'm most happiest next to a body of water. Uh, and my childhood, I'm the youngest of three boys, so I have two older brothers. Uh, and a lot of our childhood was, was either spent, we spent our Christmas holidays visiting my grandparents' place in Lali, in Gamia, in Tavuni. Uh, so, you know, from a very young age, at least I knew I had this huge affinity to the ocean and I knew that uh, whatever I wanted to do as I grew up revolved around ways in which I could protect the ocean or continue being close to it that way. Um, yeah, and so I, I guess from a young age I didn't, I didn't language it that way as a climate warrior but, um, but it involved a lot of like what is my relationship to nature and how do I nurture and, and, and yeah, and enjoy it. So I was sort of oriented looking outward to the ocean. Exactly. And you've traveled really, really far across the ocean as well <laughs> yeah. with your work. I have, I have. I've been very blessed. I think, uh, and especially now in like uh, in times of a health crisis, it's one of those things that you sort of look back on and just be like, oh, yeah, it was such a gift to be able to see so many parts of the world and meet so many people and explore different cultures. And, when you were in school, was there anywhere that you sort of, like, that you dreamed of, of visiting for any purpose that, you know, you kind of like ticked off your childhood bucket list? Uh, it was definitely Brazil, uh, mainly to the, 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 the big, the, it's called the Cristo, I think, it's the statue in Rio. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I, I got to do that when I was working on uh, one of the, the ships, the Greenpeace ships in, in Rio. Uh, and just being there and like looking up, I was just like, how is this even possible? Like a week ago, I was like walking around the Suva bus stand, <laughs> getting like a dollar worth of chili bean. And like now I'm like standing at the bottom of this like thing. I didn't know that you were on a Greenpeace boat. Yeah, I did. I've done a couple of ship tours with the Greenpeace. So I worked on the Esperanza. We did a ship tour around the Pacific as well as the Rainbow Warrior 3. So what happened with the Rainbow Warrior 3 is that selected seven young people from around the world, uh, each to represent one stripe of the rainbow. And so uh, I was very fortunate to be selected as the sort of Pacific representative. Mm -hmm. uh, and what it was, it was initially years ago, it was a, uh, it was a digital storytelling opportunity to like, you know, bear witness to what it's like to be on this tour uh, yeah, and just tell stories from that, uh, leveraging the power of social media. That's incredible. It's incredible the work that you do. Was there any particular sort of, um, was there any moment uh, growing up, when I say childhood, I mean all the way through to high school, yeah. you know, because, yeah. you know, we're all still young. Um, <laughs> but was there any particular moment that for you sort of like a formative memory, something that, that sort of has informed your life to this point? Yeah, I think one that comes to mind particularly is when I realized the power of your voice, of, of my voice, right? And I was in class six at Beuta Primary School and we had a, um, a Peace Corps volunteer teacher, Miss Kendra Sherry. And uh, there, was, there was a tuck shop at Beuto that was selling Coke. Uh, and they had like this little buddy uh, small bottles of oh, coke. I remember those. Yeah. yeah, and they were like 50 cents or something. And I was like, ah, you know, Miss Sherry, why, why is it, why are we, why are we selling so much coke <laughs> at this school? And she was like, you should do the research and tell me why coke is so bad. And, you know, this is well before the internet. And so I just used the Carnegie Did Library. Did you have an awareness of coke being bad? Like, well, where did I'd, that come from? That's a, I had like heard that it was filled with sugar. Right? Because when we were growing up and I wanted coke, my mom would be like, no, it's bad for you. And I wanted to understand why. Um, and so, yeah, and then it got me into this, like, went down this rabbit hole of just like reading as much as I can and trying to organize my thoughts in a really clear and cohesive way. And then I wrote a thing 
<laughs> and Miss Sherry looked at it and she was like, this is great, but the tuck shop is gonna remain open. Um, so I didn't, I knew what I wanted to get. I didn't achieve it, but in that failure, I learned how important it is to have an informed opinion about something, right? And that my voice actually mattered and to be told that at such a young age, it's like actually your thoughts are important, your perspective is important, your, your opinion is important. I think for me, that was such a huge turning point for me. A little island in the South Pacific called the Fiji Islands. I have been involved with Greenpeace since 2007 as an activist slash volunteer. Get up, stand up. Burning coal leads to an increase in sea level. An increase in sea level means us eventually losing our homes. We're not going to be silent about this and, and Greenpeace has given us an opportunity to have a voice, you know, to, to be able to speak out. In 2009, I was part of an action in Queensland, Australia. Um, and the action took place at a coal loading facility known as the Haypoint Coal Loading Facility. It was the lead up to the Pacific Islands Forum. And the Pacific Islands Forum is um, where Pacific leaders come together and they pretty much talk about and decide the future of the Pacific. So we hiked onto the coal loading facility and um, we had a client team. We had D-locks, we locked ourselves on there. I'm here today to urge the leaders of the Pacific to stand strong and demand that the expansion of the coal industry does not go ahead. I was sitting there, yeah? And it's freezing and I'm from Fiji and we don't get that much cold. But, you know, that numbness that you get from the cold, for me, it disappeared when I looked out and all I could see were mountains and mountains of coal. And for every mountain of coal that I saw, that was one child without a future. That was one home underwater, you know? And then, you know, you forget about the cold. You forget about how high you are up on that coal loading facility because this is, this is intense, you know? This is a whole generation without what is rightfully theirs. So you recognize the importance of your voice mm -hmm. through, this, through this very interesting experience. And I can, I can see that it's a very vivid memory for you. Uh -huh. um, and then you come out of school, and then I understand that you worked in media for a while. Mm -hmm. So was that part of you sort of discovering your voice or figuring out how to, how to speak your voice? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, it reminds me of one of my very first jobs was with, uh, <laughs> when I was very young, was with Communications Fiji Limited. And then it was, I was working FM96, doing like the graveyard shift. So whatever energy that the radio announcer was giving out, I would be feeding that in my, in my moment of like, you know, in, in a moment where I wanted to be alone, I had that influence of this radio personality. Mm. And I thought to myself, I was like, whoa, what an amazing, like privilege to be able to to be in a bedroom with somebody who wants to be alone and like say something in the background right so the, the importance of of like the power of radio in that sense it was also like one of those things when I remember going to my grandparents place when we'd be out on the, on the boat like fishing we had like a little transistor radio so for me, was the transistor radio was able to go with you everywhere. I, I saw my like uncles take it with them to the Tay Tay when they went, you know? Mm -hmm. That's all they had with them. Uh, and so it was like, from that moment with Miss Sherry, you know, it sort of just, there were more moments in life that taught me your voice is important. And if you've been blessed, if you've been given a platform, how do you use that intentionally and responsibly? Well, radio is one of the oldest platforms for voice. And for a long time, I mean, you know, we all remember it, but I mean, even beyond our generation, the radio was essentially a source of information for so many people, crucial information, yeah. which could sort of, um, which could literally save your life. Yeah. And in many ways, what you're saying is that even now, outside of times of war, outside even of times of pandemic, that voices can, can save lives. Absolutely. Uh, one, one of the things I most love about radio 
and you know any any form of media that's in the audio format is that it gives you the opportunity as the consumer of that story of that information uh, to like imagine so it's a really a, it's a theater of the mind right I love and, that theater of the mind. Yeah, yeah. and it, and it's it's like something I remember Sharon said that. So I'm borrowing a, a phrase from Sharon Bhagwan Rolls. Uh, when we were doing hibiscus, she said, you know, back in the day, we just did hibiscus and it was all on radio. And so when they were describing the garments and everything, what the you know hibiscus queens were wearing, you you really had to imagine it back then. And I was like, oh, that's so cool. Do you think radio as an art form has sort of maintained its magic over the years? Yes. Community radio, definitely. Like, yeah, 100%. Uh, you know, c commercial radio, I, th I think, as somebody who's worked in, in commercial radio, they, there is magic to it. Putting out energy for six hours, always being on. It, like is a six hour shift a real thing I never worked yeah, in radio yeah, yeah. I've only ever worked in print and now here <laughs> <laughs> yeah at, at least yeah it's about six hours or seven hours you get there an hour early yeah. and do show prep and so you're constantly thinking about and talking to people you can't see exactly yeah and so and so you how do you like focus that energy how do you put it out how do you yeah how do you do it it's a lot of work so for me that's the magic yeah. right it's somebody intentionally thinking about a space thinking about how do you connect across distance using just your voice because the voice has so much nuance and strength and color to it mm. so how do you sort of play with that to how did you then use this voice that you had found and at what moment did you decide, I am going to be a climate warrior? Did you even think that that's what it was? Was it framed like that for you? Yeah, well, such a great question. And for, for me, the, the, the memory that comes to my mind is like years and years and years ago, I was like interviewing with my grandfather. We're standing out by the ocean on some rocks and my pa had a spear in his hand and like this beautiful smile in his eyes that I still remember to this day and we were out fishing and then to pass the time my pa would tell me stories about his old people and he said you know Fintan the ocean is always going to be important to us because it has nourished and sustained us for many many years and so from that moment I was like oh yeah like I I'm connected to the ocean this way I have a responsibility this way and since then every sort of moment that I've thought about, everything that I've done, the way I've done my work has really been in service of, you know, stewardship of the environment. How do we look after it? Uh, with, with the many privileges that I've been able to access, you know, through hard work, through by, by circumstance, I've always tried to figure out a way I can leverage my proximity to privilege in service of something. So at least for a huge chunk of my life that has been around environmental stewardship uh, and, and how do you tell those stories in a meaningful way to get people in, right? The last thing you want to do is, is like uh, push people away. You know, you, you have some people that are so for a cause that it becomes inaccessible. And I think storytelling and stories and the voice, media, arts, everything, is a way in which you can speak to very different audiences and keep bringing people in because uh, we need as many people as possible. Yeah. I think storytelling in particular, you know, it's so important and it comes back, of course, um, to what you were saying. We will talk about um, the podcast soon because I think that's another form of storytelling um, and it comes back to the idea of voice. But I want to ask specifically, how important do you think the voice of Indigenous people is um, or the voices of indigenous people are in the conversation around climate change? So important. I think the dominant narrative around Pacific Islanders specifically in the context of, of climate change and the climate discourse has one that has constantly painted us as mere victims, right, of climate impacts. And, and if we're seen by the world as one way, there's no way they can see us another way. Mm. 
And so getting indigenous perspective, getting frontline voices, getting the voices of, you know, young women, young men, uh, people on, on the entire spectrum of the, of the gender spectrum, right? If you can get those voices in, we can get those perspectives in, there's, there's more nuance and richness to a story. So we're able to speak to that entire thing. And you really can't have these conversations about us without us, right? Yes. We need to be there. Uh, yeah. So it's super important. You know, in terms of expression, so, you know, we've, we've talked a lot about the voice. For me, as somebody who, um, who loves fashion, mm. um, outward expression, outward appearance is very important. The way we dress, the way that we choose to wear our hair, sure. for example. Now, your hair has been quite a journey. Uh -huh. Tell me about the journey of your hair, and then I'll ask you another difficult question. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's been about 14 months now since I, I started growing out my hair intentionally. Uh, and I've all only just used coconut oil, really, <laughs> to look after it and, and style it and whatever. I mean, there's only like two styles that you can do with my hair, right? Um, I would like to see photos uh, of the two styles. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, and for me, it was I was at a I was at a, a, a training in in the U.S. and I was surrounded by a lot of activists and thinkers and creatives and creators and uh, and dreamers and. And one of the big takeaway for me from that time was the idea of using your body as a resource, right? So uh, a lot of ways people learn is people are auditory, people are visual, uh, people are kinesthetic. So they learn with using their bodies. And so just dancing with that, I was like, oh, that's interesting. So what parts of my body can I use as a resource to center and ground my identity, right? And one of the things I, ha I hadn't thought of was hair. And how important, because uh, how how important uh, growing out a traditional Fijian hair, Fijian hair, and what that looked like, and, and how that could help me access different parts of myself, I've been taught to forget. It still is a journey. Like I don't think I know enough as as much as I should about the the journey. But for me, it's been very interesting. It's I've been able to have conversations with people around, you know, like what is the general standard of beauty that mm. you want to continue perpetuating and uplifting and how do you own your body in a way where you can stand boldly in your truth mm. right so at least at this point in my life right now this is how I'm standing boldly in my truth I, I want to grow out my winning my afro and I, and I want to see what that journey for me is gonna look like you talked about it centering you mm. do you think that it also this is a difficult question do you think that it also brings you closer your identity as an indigenous person I think so yeah I think so there's there's like and for me my connection to indigeneity is around stories right so every time I'm like like for example if I if my hair looks a certain way I'll, I'll hear like a comment from my like my mom's like oh you look like la 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 mm. right and so that way I'm connected to ancestry mm. Right? I'm connected to an ancestor, like a great, great, great grandparent's name that I've never heard. So I'm able to learn about that in that sense through story. Uh, and so this is merely a tool, a, a gateway, a pathway into a deeper conversation. And like there's so many young people that just, we don't have time to ask questions, mm. right, about family history. Well, I'm making a huge assumption about young people, but at least in my experience, right, uh, because our education system growing up, we were taught, you know, we were, uh, I've heard it phrased as a soon as lie. Mm. As soon as you get that uh, degree, you'll, you'll know who you are. As soon as you get that job, you'll know who you are. So in, the, in that sort of rat race, mm. right, we, we forget to stop and like sit with our old people and ask them questions and be like, hey, so tell me about this, tell me about that. And so at least for me, my, my hair has been, has offered some sort of uh, pathway towards that. And it's also just great to like hear from people They're like, oh, did you know this about a uh, thing? Like one of the stories I heard from, uh, from Master Simi, Simeone Sivendrende was that uh, back in the day, old people wore, they, they laid their head to rest on a kali. Mm. So it's like a wooden pillow. And I was like, well, that's so cool, right? And then, so I'm connected, so I'm like time traveling in that sense, like going back and finding out more when I have time. Uh. 
So now coming straight into your work, let's mm-hmm. just dive straight in. So 350.org, right. you're the managing director for the Pacific. That is a major role to have. And you have, you, I mean, you've single-handedly essentially sort of created so much visibility for this organization. And you've done a lot of good work. But for those that do not know what 350.org is, tell us. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we're a global organization with the, you know, the Pacific Arm, uh, obviously here in the region. And we do a lot of work around, so the science is very clear on, on climate change and how climate change is caused. Mm-hmm. And so all of the science points to the, like the excessive burning of fossil fuels. That's basically it, right? Uh, constantly the developed countries have put profit before people, profit before the Pacific. And so one of our big roles is to really look at ways in which we can build people power to dismantle the pillars of support of the fossil fuel industry, right? And so for, what that looks like is following the money, right? So there's a lot of people that, are, that profit from, from, the, from the destruction of the planet. So how do we stop that? How do we choke that? How do we simply just uh, ensure that fossil fuels stay in the ground where mm-hmm. they belong, right? And also, uh, coming back to the narrative piece, uh, how do we sort of ensure that stories that are told about frontline communities, about indigenous communities, is one that centers us as, as drivers of solutions, as, 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 uh, as like, you know, uh, stewards of this planet, uh, and so, in a nutshell, that that's what we're trying to do in this specific it's a big nutshell. <laughs> mm. In the in the Pacific specifically, we believe in uh, really growing a movement uh, of of young people that have the skills and the tools that they need to show up in these conversations. Right. So it's one thing to say like, oh, uh, let's have a young Pacific Islander at a big UNF triple C, like a big UN space. Mm. And so you get there and then it, you, mostly it's tokenized, right? Mm. It's a very tokenistic role. You go there, you get to be that. So one of the things that we want to push back against is like, how do we equip these young people with the skills? So when they're there, they're making interventions that are useful. They are courageous enough to stand boldly in their truth, right? They're able to, to carry and hold a conversation, right? Because if not, we'll just be spoken for, we'll be spoken over. So we do a lot of a lot of trainings. So, in terms of your role internationally over the years, when you've gone to these spaces, have you ever felt like the token person from the Pacific? Has that ever happened to you? When I was a lot younger, yes. Right. Um, How did you handle that? Not well. <laughs> um, but I, I, yeah, it, it was it was like one of those moments when I was just like, huh. Now I know why I'm in this room, yeah. right? Um, and it was one of those moments as well, I'm so grateful for, uh, that taught me. Again, coming back to the importance of my voice. It's just, just like, whoa, like how, how am I so disempowered right now? Like I'm allowing myself to feel disempowered right, right now. Uh, and so coming out of that, I just like quickly snapped back into it, just reminded me again, reminded myself that not everyone has the privilege to be in these spaces. Uh, and to be in the spaces requires labor, you know, both external and internal. Mm. You have to like fight those demons, tell those tell those shame devils to be quiet. You, you know what I mean? And explain that to me. Just, uh, so just, just how the mean. doubt. So yeah. all the self doubt that you can have. I'm not this enough. I'm not that enough. It's like dealing with that, doing the internal sort of labor to sort of heal from whatever trauma that you're carrying around that, you know? And then how do you express that as your external labor? Yeah. And so with that, it's just being clear on your purpose. Right? Why am I here? I have a story to tell. I'm, you know, I've been trusted by a few people to be in this space to, to say something important. So how do I just focus on the message? Uh, less on, on like the, yeah, how do I focus on the message and make it about the message and why I'm there? Uh, and, and, and for me, that's, that's how I've been able to deal. If not, I'm just caught in like all the, the drama of it all, you know, uh, which, which I, my hope is that not many Pacific Islanders have to deal with that. And so that's why for us training, empowerment, skill, skill ups, all of these things are so important. What are some of, um, oh, well, give me one particular achievement that you had that, you know, just you were like, oh my gosh, this is, my life is made, I can die now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think for me, 
One of the, my proudest moments doing this work was uh, 2014. So about six years ago now, wow. Uh, it was the 17th of October and uh, throughout the year, we had worked with different communities across the Pacific mm -hmm. uh, to build canoes. And so, build canoes. canoes, yeah. And so our, our youth volunteer group, they, they, it was an intergenerational dialogue of sorts where they asked old people, what are the skills required to build a canoe? And we built these canoes and we uh, use these canoes to blockade the largest coal port in the world, which is in Newcastle, Australia. And it was like an incredible day. We had 30 young Pacific Climate Warriors from across the region uh, using traditionally built handmade canoes to like blockade these huge coal ships and wow yeah it was it was like well wow. David and Goliath well it was like one of those things that I imagine a David and Goliath situation could look like like our canoes were this tiny and like the ships were that big do you have images of that yeah uh, yeah and it was yeah it was like I look back on that and it was just like one of those moments where I'm just like oh this is so incredible these young people manifested their dreams and they work towards it. Mm. What was, what has been a disappointment that you faced, and how have you, how have you overcome it? Right. So one of the biggest challenges that we constantly face in like the movement world, as 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 young people, is this idea that we have to keep pushing outwards. Right. We have to keep going. We have the weight of the world on our shoulders. If we don't do this, if we stop working, then things will fall apart. And, and so we really take away the power of rest, right? And the beautiful power that rest has uh, to answer the call to rest, I think is, is, is so important. And a lot of young people especially bend themselves out, right? And I can, I can, I can share the analogy of the, of the music sheet, uh, if you like that. Um, when you, when you think about the work that you do, uh, you think about a sheet of music, and then if you have just a note after note after note after note, that isn't, uh, it, it, what that is is just noise. There's no rest stops in between. And so in order to manifest the, 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 the beautiful music in your life, right, your masterpiece, you need to take those rests. And, uh, and the idea of producing outputs, output being, being output driven, I think the idea of work, 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 work is rooted in capitalism. Uh, and so as, as a, like, how do we resist that? How do we push back against that? How do we redefine what work can look like? And I think for us, it's embracing rest as part of the work, right? How do we just pause? How do we go and sit by the ocean mm. and be reminded of your connectedness uh, to nature, uh, yeah, and so my, my disappointment is I find myself perpetuating that, right? Uh, as, as somebody who, who works with young people, you're hopefully setting good examples, right? And what isn't a good example is burning yourself out. Before I let you go, let's come back to your voice. So you started off in radio, but now you have a podcast, which is incredibly popular, Beyond the Narrative. The name in itself gives away what it's about, but why don't you explain to our audience why Beyond the Narrative is the name of this podcast and what it is that you're trying to achieve through it. Yeah, I think Beyond the Narrative for me is uh, an intentional way of reclaiming stories, right? How do we get beyond the dominant narrative about a thing? How do we not shy away from nuance and complexity that I believe really uh, adds color to anything? And so the hope with Beyond the Narrative is that it allows uh, for exactly things like this, for like you sit down, you have a conversation, you be curious, you honor somebody by giving them your attention. Right? And, and with Beyond the Narrative, that's, that's what I hope to do with everyone that I, I speak with. And yeah, and it's been fun. It also is like a, a marrying of like a few of my favorite things, right? It's, uh, uh, I'm very curious about people. And so when, when somebody like 
some, somebody gives gives me the like an hour of their time I'm like okay great I'm gonna learn from as, as much as I can from you and I'm gonna like sit down with you and honor your experiences that way two it's like uh, my love for radio reinvented in this day and age and three it's uh, my uh, my love for the intentional use of social media right how do we leverage the power of social media how do we leverage this type of connectivity we've never had before mm. and how do we use that to uplift stories and voices of people how do you just provide them with a, a platform to, to get I love that you're talking them. about that because you know very often we have the conversation in Fiji around social media being a bit of a toxic space mm. and here you are saying that social media can be used to uplift and to empower people yeah. is that what you're hoping to do? Ideally, I think the yeah so social media is very toxic. Uh, it is, it is very toxic. It is very unsafe, and it is very beautiful, and it is very magical, and it is a great way to stay connected, a great way to get stories out there, a great way to uh, just build community and stay in community with people. Uh, and so it's it's not this or that, yeah. it's this and that. Right? So how do you navigate that space? How do you be intentional? Right? There's a lot of intentionality put into this. How do you... Uh, in moments that are calling you to be really mean, how do you center gratitude and, and push to practice kind of happiness, right? Because that, that's what it is. To be kind is a practice. You, you know, you can't just like, yeah, I'm kind naturally. You, you have to do the work again. Like, I'm coming back to that internal work yeah. that you need to do. And I think if you use social media in a way that uplifts, inspires, it can be a beautiful place. Absolutely. Now, in terms of, in terms of podcast, who do you feel you're impacting most when you do this? Is that, ever, is that ever in the back of your mind? Are you ever thinking, this is who I'm speaking to, this is who I'm speaking for? Mm. I mean, yes, and like I, I think a lot about my whenever I record a podcast, whenever I'm in conversation with somebody, I think about my nephews and nieces. Mm -hmm. All of my nephew and nieces are growing up in the diaspora, um, and I think about ways in which them as young people growing up uh, in, a, in a community, in a country, in a in a place that is so busy with stories uh, how do I how do I ensure that they can access stories by young Pacific people right by people that they won't see around them as often uh, so I really think about them first and foremost and then as we as, as the sort of the podcast was launched I think about the, the people that are consuming it and are interacting with me and just like the conversations that we have and like DMs and, and how much they needed to hear this at a time. Uh, and I also, one of my biggest things is like, how do I honor the person that I'm speaking with? Uh, a lot of ways, social media, the radio, media in general can be extractive. So how do I push back against an extractive industry? And how do I make sure that at the end of the day, I check in with that person, feel like, are you okay with this going out in the world? This is your truth? Because Truth telling can be an act of vulnerability, mm. and so my hope is to is to remind them that you can stay connected to your true power by being vulnerable, mm. right? Because more people need to hear these stories, more people need to feel completely unalone, and and that's my hope is like hopefully it's impacting people where they can they can see themselves in each other and like see themselves in a different light at the same time. Do you feel like all the work that you've done in your life so far and now coming to be on the narrative, has it also changed you? 100%. 100%. Uh, again, I, again I, I just feel so filled with the gratitude to be able to be called to do this work uh, and to be able to be blessed with different talents to be able to do this work and I think one of the most important things is and I, I, I heard this a while back and I, I think it's so beautiful uh, when doing this work 
uh, and you think about the story in the Bible about Noah's Ark, right? So Noah put all of the animals into the Bible. And for me, it's a, it's a conversation about what do you put into the vessel of the future, right? So in, in the time of a global pandemic, in the time of this climate emergency that we're you know, living through, what do we want to put into the vessel of the future in that sense? Right? And so for me, I think it's important to collect stories of resilience, of resistance, of like young people doing their best with what they have. Uh, I think for me, it's a, like celebrating art and supporting art in because that in itself an expression, fashion, art, music, dance, everything that you can do that continues to bring joy and, and hope into it, I think is so important. So Noah put a lot of animals into the boat, but he also left a lot of things behind. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. What would you leave? Back? What would you leave out? Such a great question. <laughs> um, I would, if I could leave out anything, it's up to me. Anything you <laughs> anything. want to leave out? <laughs> I'd leave out supremacist cultures <laughs> that perpetuate so much evil in the world capitalistic systems that don't serve anything but profit <laughs> um, that, that's I that's honestly what I'd leave out <laughs> it's a good answer <laughs> what is the future for Fenton mm, good question uh, my hope is that in the future I'm constantly called to be in service of something uh, that I constantly have the opportunities to use the talents that I've been given uh, in ways that um, build and strengthen and challenge uh, and also create. That's, that's what I'm going to be doing. I'm going to be in a space where I can be creating as much as possible. I love that. Thank you so much for joining me today. Appreciate it. Thank you for listening to me ramble. <laughs> <laughs> I love rambling. It's my favorite thing. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.